Anyway, uh, thanks, Norbert, uh, for, uh, for having me. Uh, we'll see how Blackboard goes. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about something that's been uh, in quite uh, in, the, in the physics world, uh, appearing in a lot of bits of the physics world, and you can tell by the number of names of that. So I'm going to focus on maybe a specific aspect of it, but uh, what you may probably couldn't have avoided some talk somewhere, no matter what your background is, on one of these things. Um, and all these are words for basically the same thing. There's some, some diff slight differences between everything. So non-invertible, categorical, topological, generalized, matrix product, operator, symmetries. And I put symmetries in quotes, um, well, for the following reasons. Um, so there's symmetries in the sense if, if you like quantum or you like classical uh, statistical mechanics via transfer matrix, that's what T is, H is a quantum Hamiltonian. So if you, if you like to think in terms of a Hilbert space, an operator is acting on it, there's symmetries in the sense that you can find some operator, very non-trivial operator, that commutes with this. And that's usually what we think of symmetries. But especially if you're doing quantum mechanics, but even typically classical uh, statistical mechanics, the operator is, is, uh, is unitary, or an infinitesimal version of a unitary. And that's not true here is uh, hence the uh, non-invertible word. And, and categorical, I'll say a little bit about what that is if you don't know, but that gives you a structure. Topological, because it has something to do with topology, and again, I'll give you, try and give you a little idea why that is. Generalized, that's just a dodge, um, meaning that it's not usual. And matrix product operator, I guess, is closest to the heart of this conference and tensor network, so I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, and so there's the way that um, I'm going to describe all these things. Uh, well, it's one thing, but it is, and the key way to do this is via topological defects. And so this is, I think, the best structure to do all that. And so there's a couple papers I wrote with Dave Austin and Roger Munkman. Um, so, you, um, one a while ago, one just a couple years ago. So, one thing I say, so I, I just said, you know, I'm going to often talk about this in some kind of Hilbert space formalism. But one of the nice things, this the whole setup I'm going to describe, is, is, is we don't need to work in an operator thing. So, let's think about, so this is my, a schematic picture for the partition function of some statistical mechanical model or field theory. And I'll just, at the moment, I'll just do a disk over there, and I'll do it on the torus, but just for a disk. And so this is, I'm just, just my schematic picture for the partition function. We have a lattice, I might draw a lattice, but let's just draw that. And what we're then gonna talk about is the partition function of the model in the presence of topological feedback. So uh, that's what the squiggly line, I should, let me use a, we'll use a colored line. And now I'll try and, combine, try and keep this convention. So this is some defect, and the phi is the label of the defect. I'll say a little bit more about how, what I mean by a label precisely. But, so this is some partition function. But the point is, if the defect is topological, Um, if the partition function in its presence is independent of local deformations of the path. Now, as I say, local, so if we've got a torus and it's wrapped around, I can't undo that, but I can do it around. So, for example, then this, in these schematic pictures, it will also be, I'll make it very small, it's the same partition function. And if I make it very big, so let me make it big. I'm going to stretch it all the way to the edge of the system. Um, and you think about it now, well, so I was already sloppy here. I would have had to impose some boundary condition on my model to make this partition function well defined. 
But the point is now you can think of this, you can, if you want to think of a Hilbert space of all the boundary states, you can do it that way. There's lots of nice ways of doing that. And then if I push this all the way to the edge, what I can say now is that this is equal. So let me now be a little bit more precise. This is partition function with some boundary condition one. But then z sub phi will be then equal to z with some boundary condition two. So let me draw it a blue boundary condition. Yeah. And so the, the whole the setup that I'm going to describe allows you to make sense of all of these things and put them all in a unified thing. And in fact, it allows me to do one more thing here, which is in fact, I can relate this thing in the presence of the defect. So this is all still the same partition function. So this is. Sorry, I see it said boundary condition two. And then uh, um, this picture, I can actually then relate it to just this one, but then with some number, which I'll call d sub phi. The setup I'm going to describe gives you a precise way of doing everything I just drew on the board, and actually a lot more than I'll tell you about. Okay, so that's where I'm going. Now, why, how these two boards are related to each other. Well, if you think about it, if I were to do this say, out of torus or do this via some time evolution or some trotterization or whatever you like to do, well, the, the fact that this thing, this thing, the partition function doesn't depend on how I draw this path is exactly what I wrote up there. So these, these two bits, so this is, that bit is exactly the same because the defect is up there. Okay. So that's that's an overview of where I'm going in case uh, I'm a bit lost in details. And again, I mean, this is like a, a treating this like a class, so please interrupt whenever you um, shout. Okay, so um, so now uh, this conference is about tensor networks, so I'll say two words. So, so <laughs> tensor networks really do provide a great setup for this, but uh, shockingly, uh, to this audience, you, I'm old, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not that old. Tensor networks existed before they were named. In fact, they go back at least probably, probably more, uh, certainly more. But um, I'm going to describe now, uh, sorry, let me keep this one down. I'm going to describe uh, some work that took place about 50 years ago and uh, describe how uh, tensor networks one of their first beautiful applications. Okay, so this is all just reviews, definitions. This is a model, which is right. It's called the Q-state POTS model. And it's, if you don't like that, it's the icing model of IK Q equals two. So the model will be, it'll, will be for simplicity on a square lattice. In fact, I'm gonna put it for simplicity on a torus, so it's L by M, that means L cites this direction, and M cites in that direction. And just to make life a little more exciting, I'm gonna take, uh, the, well, allow the couplings to be different in the horizontal and vertical direction, so that's Jx and Jy. So anyway, this is, I hope, no surprise to any of you. That's a partition function. You define an energy, which I'll describe in a second. You define an energy and you sum over all the configurations. In this model, there's Q states, which for possibly useful reasons later on, I start counting at zero, just like a hotel in Europe as opposed to America. You start at zero and you go to Q minus one. And I sing the two states that are usually called plus and minus, and I sing I'm calling zero and one. All right, and the energy is very simple. It's kind of the simplest energy you could possibly write down um, that has non-trivial interactions. You just ask, are adjacent spins the same or different? So that's not what you read here, but that's what the uh, this is. It's Kronecker delta, say in the two spins. And we have a coupling Jx if there are horizontal neural neighbors. And likewise, we do Jy, and that's term for all the vertical neural neighbors. So we add up all those energies, and there we get the and if you like operators, probably everyone in the Tensor Network conference does. The way to write all this stuff out 
is the in, in a classical model is to think of this in terms of transformers. Um, so to think about adding one row at a time. So first what we do is we add on all the horizontal uh, interactions. And I hope you can read that in the back. Well, all this is saying I add on a factor e to the beta j. There. And since it's a sum up here, it's a product along here. So you take the product of all the nearest neighbors. You get e to the beta j if they're the same. You get 1 if they're different. Now it's kind of the same thing going this direction, but now since I'm thinking of an operator, these are the matrix elements of that operator. Um, when I add one there, um, I wrote it in this kind of funny way, which will be useful later on, but the one to go up, well, if they're the same, I get e to the beta j, but the way I'm going to write it out is as a Kronecker delta, so sigma and sigma prime are the spins on the two rows, so this is sigma j. This is sigma j prime for the two rows. And then, so if they're the same, I get e to the beta j y minus 1 plus 1. But if they're different, you just get 1. I just wrote that out a little funny way. But that's the matrix elements. And then you multiply all those together. Um, you take, if you have m rows here, and make periodic boundary conditions with trace of that operator. So I know this, for many of you, this is utter pedantry, but I want to make sure. Can I touch base? Any questions about that? Right, so that's the model that I'm going to, for the most part, discuss, although I'll try and phrase everything in a presumably general fashion. So, I'll do that. so now I'm going to rewrite these transfer matrices in possibly. All right, so I'm going to write out the transformation. Oh, oh, sorry. Since we're mostly in quantum land here today, I should say. I'm writing in terms of the transfer matrix. But then, typically, in all the models I discuss, you can define a quantum Hamiltonian by taking an appropriate limit where the transfer matrix is almost the identity times some operator. So that's one of the reasons why I took the jx and the jy different. But you can work it out if you're bored what the precise limit you take of jx and jy. One goes to 0, other goes to infinity, or something like that. And then the, Hamil the transfer matrix is almost the identity, plus a small correction. That becomes the quantum Hamiltonian. Since we're already working a vector space formulation, we did this. So, so all right. So now what I, I want to do is to rewrite the transfer matrix <coughs> algebraically. And this is the stuff from 50 years ago that I really think counts as a tensor network. So what I'm doing now, so I kind of already did that. So what I'm going to do is write each T1 is something, and this is some operator. Okay, and it's, again, it's the product over all these things. Those are the matrix elements, but I'll think of it as an operator. But um, now, but then for T1, for T1, so, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, wait. Uh, so I'm going to define. Two L operators, uh, E, well, let's call it LR. So, R is two L. so I'm going to rewrite T1 like that. And so again, this T1 is the one that just measures whether the two spins are adjacent. And if I rewrite this operator, let me go over here, um, where E2J, so these are half of the E's. Um, will look like, sorry, no, no, let me write out the whole thing first. So, so T1 is the product of, so the uh, matrix elements again. Sorry, let me write it. This is how I write it. So the E, 2j matrix elements. Well, 
will look like e to the beta x minus 1 times delta sigma j, sigma j plus 1. So again, it's doing the same trick. So what I rewrote this, I probably should have put up. So what I did was, so what I did was rewrite e to the beta j x as delta sigma j sigma j plus one. Sorry, I should have written some of this stuff out. Um, it's rewriting this in the same trick I used for the y's. So I just use this trick of writing the thing in the exponent, expanding it out because the squares to itself. Sorry about that. So then you get the matrix elements of E two J by that. Okay. Sorry, that was. And likewise, the operator E two J minus one is going to come from T two. So we were going to write T2 as the same product times E. And sorry, and then I need a constant factor here, which I'll call X to be J. And X plus Y to be J minus 1. And e to the 2j minus 1 come from those bits there. And so times some numerical factor. I'll leave out. And so this one is then the same deal. Um, this is. That up there, so delta sigma j, sigma j plus one times some So you you muck around with this and did I did I oh, sorry. Anyway, so you rewrite this algebraically. Don't pay Numerical factors aren't super important. I think I wrote them out right. But the point is, I'm, I'm decomposing this transfer matrix, this operator, into a sum of 1 plus x times the non trivial bit. That's some number, and that's some number. That can work out. And at the end of the day, so. So at the end of the day, what I've done is I've written this operator in, well, it, it looks like a standardized form. But then there's this obvious thing. What did I do? You know, why did I write the E's in this unified notation? It's a unified notation, but the two things look at least kind of different. They sort of look the same. The reason why I did that is because this thing satisfies a bunch of nice properties. Let me write out what those are. So just for the definitions I gave, what you can see is the E's as defined on this is any E. So for any E, even or odd, it squares to some constant times itself, which if you 
work it out, and that's why the square root of q got stuck in there. Is right there. So emphasize this is n even or odd. Okay. And there's another relation. It's even less. That one's not so hard to show, but this other one isn't so obvious. And it's the fact that they obey that. So this is a relation between even and odd. It applies for either. Okay, so what, what we did, or I should say more importantly, what Temperley and Lee did, And moreover, they notice quantum Hamiltonians in those days they most of the people working on this weren't super interested in Hamiltonians. And they probably haven't heard of that, but if you take this Hamilton, very famous, XXC spin chain, including the Heisenberg model, among others, and also Here's now where it really starts to get interesting. So also loop models can be written in the same way. So let me now So again, so we're always going to keep this definition, as long as we're doing temporally leave stuff, we're always going to keep, well, both these definitions. So of the even and odd ones. We always write the transfer matrix in this form. And the partition function will always be given by that for all these models. And also, well, all the models I'm telling you about satisfy the same properties. I should have done this first. And Norbert and Roger attempted to teach me correct blackboard technique here. <laughs> Clearly, they failed as <laughs> they, Maybe at the beginning of the conference, we should all have a next, session. Next, uh, session. Start with a course. Uh, and, uh, yeah, session uh, on a course. Yeah. 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 Back. Yeah. Um, right, so one of the other things that was observed, and a key early paper again in 1971. It's one of these things that, I don't know, somehow sometimes something gets in the air. So even though the result that I'm about to tell you was actually not done by temporarily, they were done, the papers were within a few months of each other. So the result I'm about to tell you is more or less due to Fortuyn and Castelline. They didn't phrase it in this algebraic language, but quickly people realized that, that in essence, temporally and leave in Fortuyn and Castelline were doing the same thing. And the result is the following. Okay, so we've got some algebra here, up there, the temporally things temporally leave algebra. We define a transfer matrix with generators satisfying that. But then the remarkable thing that Bertone and Castelline observed was I can get um, uh, this algebra by defining a bunch of pictures. So it's a, a, a graphical presentation of the algebra, not rep 
I learned at some point this, I should call this a different presentation of the algebra. So I, I draw a bunch of lines. So they act on, so the E sub J act on a bunch of strands. So we would have L for our case. We have a bunch of strands. And then acting with E sub J, say for between the J and the J plus first strand, E would do that. So this would be E sub J. And so now just think of it as some operator. We have all the EJs, and what they do is just cap it off and then start a new one. And it acts on these strands. And so now you get the temporally leave algebra. up there if if we make if closed loops get a factor square root of q. And so now let me show that. So, so the point is ej squared, well, as an operator, we've got some strands coming in. We cap it off. And we start another one. But then we're doing it twice. So you cap it off again. And you do that. But if I... Under the rule that closed things, yeah, well, I can just forget that. So we replace this with the square root of q, and then we get square root of q times that is equal to square root of q. Times j. Okay. Well, that's kind of cool. The one that always never ceases to amaze me is the other one, the e and j, j plus 1, since we're here, right there, which is the following, or M, I guess. So, okay, so there's, we start with three strands now, M, M plus one, M plus two strand. So I act with this. This one's just going along. And, and I act with that. Okay, but then I act with this again. So this is E M, E M plus one, E M. Right, but you can now, if I make a rule, so the second rule I make, if closed loops get a factor of Q, and I'm free to deform, Continuously form three to continuously deform the graphs. Well, then I can just form this to that times that, which is just yeah. So there's the temporally leave algebra graphically, and so this was all observed in 1971. And why I say this really was tensor networks is because this is what temporal lever took this from. This is a tensor network. Transfer matrix is a tensor network. And then, moreover, combining that transformation to this is a tensor network. We don't have to prove it. So what they then so they observed that lots of models could be written in this fashion, and. And then they said these models are equivalent. And equivalent, I put quotes on, they don't put the quotes. But you have to be super careful um, with boundary conditions. You have to be super careful with, um, are these operators unitary, which they're not. So they're, they're not invertible. As I started out by saying at the beginning. So there's lots of subtleties, most of which they, they were aware of the subtleties. But what they didn't know is uh, 
how to put them in a general formulation. I'm going to tell you that. But let me give one example. Since I put duality in the title of the talk, let me now do give you one application, which they did know about at the time. So there's a very old, even older than temporary leave, classic result of Kramer's and Wannier in stat -Net, in the icing model. And then it was generalized in the 50s in the POTS models. And again, in talking about the coincidences of uh, people doing the same thing at the same time, POTS um, generalized what I'm about to tell you to from icing to Q state models. So Kramer's and Wannier did the Q equals 2 case, where it got 0 to 1. Um, POTS generalized it. But literally, again, within a year or two of each other, the mathematician Tut invented a thing called the Tut polynomial. And he invented it precisely because it obeyed this duality and actually a bunch of other things. He was ahead of, more or less ahead of the StatMec people, at least in thinking about these things. And he, uh, and, and so again, the, the Tut polynomial, if you ever see this in the literature, is the partition function of the Potts model. They're literally identical objects up to overall constants. And, uh, but he came at it from a very different direction. So the stuff was in the air again in the early 50s. But so what the Kramer's 1A duality says is now look at a model on the dual lattice. So it's living like that. And then there's couplings, which I'll call J, Y, hat, which do that direction, and then J, X, hat, do there. And what Kramers and Wanier showed uh, is that the model the original model on the original lattice, so that with couplings Jx and Jy, I'm gonna, again, I'm going to avoid subtleties with boundary conditions. These two aren't exactly the same. Yeah, there's a lot of subtleties you have to deal with. So I'll just put a line there. Is that the partition functions of the model on the original lattice is, quote, the same. It's not the same because it, it depends on boundary conditions. But up to boundary conditions, the partition functions are the same. But this temporally leap setup um, allows you a beautiful way of seeing this. So I'm not going to go through it because I'm not going to have enough time. But it's not, it's five minutes at this point. The point is you define the dual T1 and you define the dual T2. But when you do it, you rewrite to so the proof, one way of proving it, not the way Kramer's Wania did, but actually it's to some extent, it's the way Kramer's Wania did it, they just didn't say it this way. So the proof of this statement is to rewrite the dual model in terms of the same, well, in terms of the temporally leave algebra. And then you've defined the E's in different ways, but they still satisfy the exact same relations. Enough to prove stuff, some stuff, but again, ignoring the boundary conditions, that's important. You get the same partition functions up to the boundary conditions. And, and the setup lets you deal with the boundary conditions. I just don't have the time. Yeah, it takes a little bit. It's not, it's not difficult, you just have to do it. And so this is this is. Okay, so should I place to stop for questions? Because now I'm going to generalize it. But uh, okay. you want to say here that there's some relation between the J's and J hats? I mean, yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Right, because exactly. So what happens? Yeah, this X. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Say that. So X and Y depend on couplings, and I think this is uh, if I didn't, if I wrote. In my notes, right, that's x and that's y. No, 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 sorry. The 
Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So I should have written that. So I should have written it that way. And there's probably. And I did an overall constant there. Yeah. Um, but the point is, yeah. So you you yeah. So you do that with x, and then you get an x hat. Um, so I might as well write out it. So so the equivalence you get at the end of the day. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't even write this out. that you got e to the beta jx. In fact, I can never remember the relation. I, I used to always look it up on Wikipedia, but now I can remember what I just showed you well enough, so I just derive it. And that's the relation. So if you, actually, no, I guess we'll say for a second. So you think about it, so what we're, when we're going on here, in the original model, So the JY, so this would be a JY in the original model. So JY is related to a J hex X hat. And that turns out to be the relation when you sort it out. And then there's the same relation where you reverse X and Y. So yeah, so sorry. With, very important, with these equivalences. Thank you. Good, yeah. What were these guys interested in in the 1970s? What was going? What were the, what were the relevant questions for them? Was it evaluating the partition function explicitly? Or? Yeah. Well, so I don't know how they got on this, but they they were interested in proving these equivalences. As they say, and so, we, so they'll say we prove we showed that the temporal that that the the Q state Potts model is equivalent in the set quote equivalent to. The, X, uh, the six vertex model, which was a famous model. So, for example, and then they got something really big. You've heard of, a, you may have known the fact that the Q state Potts model has a self dual point under this. And so, it is a phase transition, but it's not critical for Q rated four. And Duminel Copan actually proved that recently. But I believe Tupper and Lieb were the first people to show that. Um, because the fact that uh, uh, six vertex model slash XXC is known to be not non critical when delta, in, in, if you know that language, when delta is greater than one or less than minus one. And uh, when you map that to pots, you see that's Q greater than four when you go through that map. So they so they really got physics out of it immediately by just noticing this this equivalence. Um, and so, yeah, that's what, it, I mean, Lieb, Lieb had solved all the, Lieb sort of shifted from math to physics, and uh, he had proved all these things, and then I think, uh, Lieb told me, in fact, here, he was, he was here, and I remember asking him about this. He unusually um, actually said this was, I, I see, said basically this was Temperley's kind of thing, and, and he was Temperley, who is a stat mech person. So yeah, it was just they were trying to expand the number of models that they understood. In those days, this was before Yang Baxter, so they you were know, trying to just understand more models. <coughs> Any other questions? All right, so I got about 20 minutes to tell you about the new stuff, which is enough to give you a good overview, I think. So what what the new stuff and well, what a bunch of people done. So in my abstract, I said something today. Let's that. Yeah. Let's kill this. So what the the new? So okay. So I mentioned the duality because you can ask: Is there any way to map directly? So this is an equality of partition functions, and then you can ask the question: Is there a way? So you can ask, is there a way to directly map between to map between a model and its dual? So I, I just what Kramers and Wanier and most of the people do is just an equality at the level of partition functions. 
important, important and useful. But you might want to know, can you map directly between the two? Is my proving wrong? So I want to ask, is there some way And so let me draw my schematic pictures again. Is there some way? Well, first let me draw it on the torus. Since that's what I'm doing. That's fine. Is there some way that you can map the vector space, the Hilbert space, of the original model to the dual model? So in the original model, spins were living there. We have a vector space of all the configurations of those spins. And then on, we have the dual model living there. So you can ask, is there a way to map directly between the two? Is there some operator that does this? Call that operator d sigma to use. And the answer is yes. We'll be telling you if it weren't. And it, so can you map here? Such that now, let's let me now draw the schematic picture. Well, so let's, this is now my torus instead of the disk that I was drawing before. And so can I make an operator, the, well, d sigma, particular before. So here's the, the original model. And then here's the dual model. So what I really mean if I'm on the lattice is that I've got sites on the original lattice here. And then we have a transfer matrix evolving here. And then in the dual model, we have there. So in other words, if we have T, So it commutes, quote, commutes with the time evolution, the vertical evolution, in the following sense, is it starts with the model where the transfer matrix acts. We then act with this operator d phi. And, and then we can commute it through, and then instead acts with the transfer matrix. So that's what we mean by commute. So this is obviously not commuting two different operators, but this is a defect. Yes. And so the answer is obviously yes. So that's why I, I, I put some, as a race now, I put symmetries in quotes. I, mean, I don't really like the name of symmetries for this. If it's, it's now the standard, so I have to use it. it, it what, what I'm describing here is really a map between two models, in this case, the original and the dual. And the point is the setup of topological defects allows you. Uh, well, it allows you to do this. They exist. And the setup that lets you do it is that of fusion. So there's multiple experts in the audience of people who know far more about fusion categories from the mathematical point of view than I have, but uh, I'm, I'm a lowbrow guy, so I, I, I'm happy for people to do this, and I learn from them, and I will distill in, how much time? Okay, good, I will distill in five minutes everything at least I need to know about fusion categories, uh, others. We still have like 25 minutes including questions, just so we don't... Is there 25? Oh! Well, we said 70 minutes including questions. Oh, okay. If you expect lots of questions, you finish by 12, you still have 10 minutes oh. questions. Oh, super. Oh, that's right, I started at 11. Not, I was thinking I started at 11. 11. So okay, so 25. Oh, good, all right, so good, I can... I'm still going to do it in five minutes, but that means I can... Have jokes in no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, this is always the problem with talks is, you know... 
you, you really should save the jokes for later, you know, at the beginning when the audience is fresh. You know. <laughs> no, okay, yeah, should I just do five minutes of shtick now to wake everybody up? Yeah. Well, that, you know, any more questions so I can do some shtick or no? <laughs> um, okay, so good. Uh, again, what's that board about? Uh, this board. And I'm giving up on the water. The, uh, I failed. I failed on the water. The, uh, okay, so every so honestly, so fusion categories give you this whole setup that <clears throat> lets you both generalize what Temper and Lieb, Lieb did to huge classes of lattice models. So yeah, first before I before I start the clock, let me tell you what they're good for from my low graph point of view. So this is fusion categories. Now I'm going to get all fusion categories on one board. This is the goal. Um, so one thing they let you do generalize temporally to a host of models. And we're temporally leave. Um, you may uh, you may know, so you know, Jones independently reinvented the temporally Lieb algebra when he invented his famous polynomial. Um, I don't know if he was genuinely, if he was disappointed to discover. Um, it was uh, a guy, uh, uh, Di Evans, David Evans, who, uh, who told him that this algebra he had just derived existed in the stat -Mac literature, as opposed to many people, though, and said he embraced that. And he was one of the few mathematicians who I've met who really, really understood how the, the physics works as well. So, so this was kind of came, again, simultaneously, same era. People were, uh, Jones was doing his thing, and physicists had finally really cracked how to do this. And so one example, there's anyone in my crowd here, what's called the BMW algebras. Um, and um, and after, second, is this name after the car or after some people? Berman, Murakami, Wenzel. There's actually two papers, one by Berman and Wenzel, the other by Murakami, and some some people, un-German un people write BWM, but that just feels wrong for so many <laughs> reasons. So it's, it's yeah, Berman, Wenzel, Murakami. The car is actually named after the algebra. Yeah, yeah, the car is named after the algebra, right? The, yeah. So this was post. This was what you know the post Jones era when people were trying to think. Okay, Jones model is fantastic, and we come up with generalizations. And that was. I mean, there were other. There are others as well. This one was a, a one, really well suited, and it can be rephrased in, in this language. So you can generalize and temporally leave to a host of models, and then in all these models. Find exact lattice topological defects. And, uh, and in particular, and one thing I want to emphasize, I'll say it again in a little while, but I want to emphasize this does not require integrability. People, it, people often get modeled because models built on temporally lead models, if you take the weights uniform in space, that's crucial. But if you take the weights uniform in space, they're then integrable. Um, but that's not true in the generalizations. But everything um, about the lattice topological defects that I'll, I'll at least outline will, will do that. OK, so now one board, one poorly erased board. I'm going to say all I need to know about fusion categories. OK, so we have a bunch of what, what they were called objects. Um, in the category, yeah. Say what you mean by exact. So it means that this relation, for example, and its appropriate generalization, holds exactly on the lattice. As opposed to in some continuum. As opposed in some limit. As opposed to some field theory thing. Yeah, they, I, you know, there's lots of papers in string theory about this now, you know, from, from string theorists, I should say. And but the thing I will keep saying over and over, but you know, not only does it work on the lattice, it's exact on the lattice. You don't have to do some fudge, you know, oh, you know, takes it. So it's completely everything commutes exactly. The formulas are exact. And at the end, I'm gonna run out of time. 
but um, it, it then allows you to drive some physical quantities from the defects, but exactly on the lattice, which is really remarkable. I mean, even for most beton sod stuff, you know, it's some you take to get a number, a rational number out. I mean, that, but, but for example, one of the things on the punchline, Andreas invented with uh, uh, Ian Affleck a long time ago, these G factors that, that they invented. Um, I just, just throw away. Um, the, uh, uh, anyway, so that's the answer. Yeah, good. Before you get into the, all the fuss of fusion categories, so in the modern answer network, can one understand this this equality as a mapping between the physical uh, yeah, 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 yeah. and the physical virtual ones? But quality gives more than that. Uh, it, it is that. I mean, it's it, it. It is lots of things, but it is it is among other things exactly that. Yeah. So it's a you can think of it, it's a mapping from one Hilbert space, if you like the quantum, to another, but with extremely nice properties. Okay, so a fusion category, one board. Okay, now I'm starting the clock, five minutes. Um, objects, uh, uh, so there's a bunch of objects, you know, which we label by alpha. For example, the, could be, uh, for icing, let's do icing, because a lot of you, there's three objects, which we will call them the usual H1 sigma size, the usual ones that I've done. And, but then there's vertices, which, we can think of as a tensor product, so if I label alpha beta, so as a tensor product, alpha beta gamma, times the gamma vertex, the gamma object. So take a tensor product of these of two objects, and this number is a non-negative integer in all the examples I will do if it's zero or one. And, and so you, this is just things really, so we give it, so everything, let's see, I'll circle my code, everything is given to you by a mathematician when you specify a category. So this is data, think of it as data. So it's giving you a bunch of objects, it's giving you a bunch of numbers that tell you what happened when they fused together. And so you draw this if n alpha, beta, gamma, is equal to one. If it's higher, you have to do some other stuff. If it's two or whatever. Okay, so that's so that's basically, and so what it does for you, the set of rules I'll tell you about in a minute, I'll be in a minute, is it allows you to evaluate uh, trivalent crests. And what evaluate means is turn into a number. Oh, I forgot one key word, labeled trivalent graphs. And so what that means is I draw some picture and I label all these. I probably have some more. But, uh, so, on. so that's some. Um, Trivalent graphs. So an evaluation means basically turn that graph into a number. Depending obviously on all the labels and how they put together. And so this is why you can see it has something to do with knot invariance. How people study knot invariance came up with a lot of this stuff. Okay. Uh, that was just an example of this thing. And so the rules to evaluate it. Two minutes left. Six are the following. So if I've got a closed loop, oh sorry, so data. So I've got the, the data is the objects and the numbers. So the data and the ends. The data we have a number, v sub alpha for each object. That's called the quantum dimension. And then this is actually a special case of these things called f symbols. So again, these are data, and that's it for the data. And the rules are, if I have a loop of type alpha, 
When I'm doing an evaluation, I just give it that number, the quantum dimension. Something slightly more complicated, if I get something like this, a bubble, and we'll call it gamma, gamma prime, alpha beta. To evaluate this, well, it goes into the line times delta gamma gamma prime, and then square root of d alpha, d beta over. I take my graph, the thing I just raised. And the last thing is that I take any time I have something like this, so alpha, beta, and the delta. Delta. Okay, so anytime I have that, I can replace it. Well, this didn't quite make So what it says is anytime I run those graphs, the one I just drew and then erased. I can replace it with that. And so the point is any time, so again, I have my graph, and I'm doing this with all the labels, I can keep doing these manipulations. And you can prove that you can keep reducing them so you get a bunch of things like this or things like this, and then uh, get a number. And so that's, for me, that's all I need. But so my point is now to go back to the, that's the mathematics that, that, that I say people in this room have made great contributions to. So we're going to use that. And then, well, first of all, so the two things I said are on a race, well, we can use this to define a bunch of models. So in the temporally leap case, So remember, the transfer matrix was built as a product of 1 plus some number times EI. But what we, um, um, and same for T1 and T2. But if I want to write this pictorially, well, the identity looks like that, plus x times that. And in general, fusion categories. So the way we generalize these models is to do the same thing. So we get this product over all these things. And this is this is the J from the J's plus one strand. And so the product is overall J. And in general, what we do is just have a product of, so we have a product for each J. And then we sum over all things of this form. I'll just try dashed to emphasize it's different as well. Okay. So these all have to have labels, which so instead of just summing over these, we have a bunch of channels, and then this is in each on each strand. So the point is again, this is acting on something that looks like this. And then on each of these, we do this. And the point is using all the stuff on that board, so using the fusion category data, can construct the item potent, yes, or projectors. And I think we're physicists, so for projectors. So just like the temporally leave was a projector, you, you act with it twice, it gives itself back again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm just a bit confused about the relation to like non abelian anions and quantum dimensions. So yeah, I would say anything about anions, yeah. No, 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 but I mean, the, the fusion category structure is the same as for, for anions. Yeah, yeah, that's right. 
But in an Indian model, you have non-abelian coinciding with a, a quantum dimension larger than one. So, but your loop weights are al already non-unity uh, in the case where you have abelian endian. So already in your simplest example of the two-state Koch model, you get the. Yeah, that's right. So that's, right. that's this is just not a one-to-one. No, it's not. It's not a one-to-one thing. Yeah, that's that's the thing I keep on. Oh, well, there's subtleties with boundary condition, but that's absolutely right. No, it's not. It's not one-to-one. -one. It's and you know, it's, it's the, the, the long ago physicists were sort of ahead of this game. And and, and in fact, denicing people by brute force had kind of understood what I'm going to tell you in a few minutes, but um, they had no idea that it's general setup. And then that's the whole point. Yeah, when you have non on dimensions that aren't just one, everything is much more complicated. But it worked. Any more minutes? Good. Any more? Keep passing. We'll, we'll just, I'll just dissolve at the end. <laughs> but yeah, okay. A few more things I want to say. So okay. So this was a bit quick and schematic, but I hope it was not too schematic that you don't get the idea. So, so terminally you can generalize. And so the BMW algebra is one set of algebraic relations that's really interesting. And that's you. And in the physics language, um, BMW algebra, on the, it, one type of BMW algebra, the simplest BMW algebra, underlies spin one chains, if you like spin one chains. Um, right, so you can construct these. And then to get this, so this is this, this loop model. So this is in loop language. But to get local models, so there what you do is you, you define your, your space Your space of states are defined by drawing something like this. And what these are is you specify some object here, and I'll call that rho. So you put that there instead of common mentioned anions. People sometimes call these things anion chains. But the idea is much older and much more general than that. And in here, you would have degrees of freedom here. So these are the spins. And then the rule is that for such a configuration to be allowed, and H1 or Hj is J plus 1 rho equals 1. So this thing gives you a, a vector space of configurations. And then by using the category rules like this, you can define um, vectors in the same way. So again, there's a general position, a general prescription for doing this. The mathematicians, um, again, in, invented this a little after the physicists, but in a much more general fashion than all the shadow work sometimes. Right, okay. So good, let me now get to the punchline. So the point is, Started out and occasionally interjected stuff about defects, so that's gonna. And I think finally this one is gonna bite the dust. Well, that's good again. Yeah, so I keep saying transfer matrix, but you can always take a. Well, in all the examples I know of, there's a nice limit you can take and get a quantum Hamiltonian. Right, so the payoff, well, first the payoff is already. That you can generalize, can really lead to lots of models. And that's interesting. People did this a lot in the 80s when they were searching for new integral models. But the, um, then they basically had to re resort to brute force to find integral models. If you're interested in models, uh, in Boston history, it's more interesting things I can say. But today we'll do topological defects. And as I mentioned a little while ago, the setup. Gives you the topological defects of a group. The 
And so let me just show. And so these things commute. And so the way it works, so now I'm going to be, for the last five minutes, I'm going to be very schematic. But I hope I've said enough. So that's the space of states. But then my defect, let's find another color. For my defect, here I run this along here. But to define, so this is the defect labeled phi. So we have one defect. for every object, labeled by that object. Remember, the object is a list of things in there. And so then, but we can then define its action on the Hilbert space by using these all those moves up there. So let me show you how that goes. So basically, so I define, I got a Hilbert space, I define via this, but then I can define the action on the Hilbert space files. Well, I can, using moves that I've described up there, well, I can then make this equal to some sum here, put some f's, and then I can do, do glue that there. So again, we're doing periodics, so this wraps around the world. We do that there, and then this is another one some other state there. But then I can move that down. We get some more F symbols. I move that down. So I can drag this through there. If you look at that's an F mode there. And so I can then move this down. So I started here instead. Do this. And there's some numbers and there's some sums. And then I can keep moving it around the world until I end up with basically going all the way around the world. Down here. And then just a little bit left there. Again, lots of sums, lots of s, all that, but not hard to write out. And then I use the bubble one to get rid of it. So now I've just got so I've got that. Lots of sums. But anyway, I've defined the action. But the point is, that's the, the definition, but then it commutes. You need a category which contains both the objects on one side and on the other side of the reality, right? You just start with a category. So there's general, sorry, to do this, maybe Lawrence is going to talk about this later. But you need by, if, so the, the, the thing I talked about, you have one category and it's, it, and things getting reshuffled. So yeah, I'm out of time. I can show how this goes for us. I'll tell you later. So there it's just sort of reshuffling between. You can define multiple models using the same category, and this shuffles between them. If you want to go to models that genuinely so different categories, for example, orbifolds are an example of this, um, then you have this bi category structure, which you'll tell us about later on Wednesday. And, um, and what happened then, then, so you have two categories, but, and then another structure that tells you how to put the two of them together. So, but I'm still. Yeah, so so it, it it's just different models can be defined using the same category. Yes, and so I, I can give you more examples, but ask me about the details. I, I want to get if I have a few more minutes, I can tell you some fun models. Um, the uh, right. So so this defines it. So commutes with the projectors, and so that's how you get relations. So, and then, so you do what I outlined for temporary leave again, and then this gives you this operator d sigma. But the, one of the great things, so for icing, yeah, so let's go back to icing. Finish off, I'll illustrate some things.
So we have an object for each. And so icing, again, the category has these three objects, one sigma and psi. And the fusion rule, the interesting fusion rule is psi. That. Oh, sorry. And then, yeah. and then one is the identity. So when you pencil it back, you just get it. So those are the non trivial ones. So that's the icing category, which also gives you the icing model. One, again, caution again, just because we name a category and you do this for a lattice model, you don't necessarily get that lattice model. I don't know if anyone's going to talk about Hagara. One of probably one of many examples that that problem that we definitely where the naming doesn't always conform to reality. Um, anyway, so this category. So what we get the d sigma is this duality. So d psi is just spin flip defect. So it just flips. all the spins. But. Okay, from the setup, something amazing happens. It automatically, again for free, with no additional work, the defects obey the same fusion rule. So this rule says that d psi times d psi, so I do duality twice, equals one plus, oh, sorry, I said psi. Let's say d sigma times d sigma is 1 plus d psi. So let me draw that in pictures. So we have our, uh, that picture's back there. I lost. All right, so we have our d sigma. And so this is our model. This is now we map to the dual model. So there it's the dual model. But say we do it again. Well, then we're back to the original model up there, the model again, and then we can put it on the torus. Well, put it easily on the torus. So it's a perfectly legit configuration. You act with this operator, change the model to a model, you act with it again, you get back to the original. But because of this rule, well, what we get is just the model again. That's the identity. That's nothing. Right. But then we don't just get that. We get now the spin flip defect. So if you wish there's twisted boundary conditions in there. And um, so it's not so simple. Duality is the wrong name for this. Kramer's Money I kind of knew, noticed this at the beginning. You don't, you do this twice, you don't get the original model. You get a projection error. This is, this is prayer. So d sigma has zero eigenvalues. Because d psi squared is one. So you can see that d sigma has, the, the eigenvalues of d psi are plus or minus one, so the minus one eigenvalues of squared is zero. It's in fact zero. So, Anyway, so good, now I've, I've run over, so let me, all right, I'll just, I'll make a few conclusions. So, so anyway, so this whole picture, and then, yeah, so let me just say, outline two more things. These, the thing that, so people kind of knew this in the literature before, David, Roger, and I uh, did this, but what, what they didn't know, even for icing, so in the year 2016, we actually said something new about the icing model. Um, we can make these defects branch and fuse, so we can go away from this, picture of just drawing them across. And we can do it all in the plane, and these defects can branch and fuse. And again, they obey the same rules that their categorical cousins uh, obey. And so this has lots of implications. Yeah, so I said in answer to a question before, you can compute things in the lattice. So there's the g factors of Andreas and Ian. There's uh, you can compute up to half integer shifts, dimensions of operators exactly. So the statement is, is we do an exact computation on the lattice, you get an answer, a rational number in these cases, for a dimension of an operator, up to shifts of half. If 
that that's an exact result. The duality is an exact result. There's no ambiguity. So if the model has a continuum with it, which only in rare cases can we prove, but if you presume, like physicists typically do, well, there's some nice limit in some field theory, then this is an exact constraint on the field theory. So if if your favorite, if if you believe that the icing field theory is the continuum limit of the icing model, well then this thing, the 2D case, gives you exact constraints. And people have now discussed these ideas going on uh, to higher dimensions. In fact, this equation has, seems to hold in higher dimensions uh, for duality. There, duality exists in higher dimensions. That's long known. But the fact that these prop this property of our numbers is not. So anyway, so anyway, so I'm done. No, I'll just stop there. <laughs> no more. Thanks. Thanks. For